I am with you always until the end of the world. Good evening. We conclude our series on the armor of God tonight uh, with a look at God's great power, our God who loves us so much, he cares about us, he cares about our problems, he cares about our situations, he cares about our burdens, and I believe truly that he's going to bless every single man, woman, and child who is seated here tonight. Do you want to say amen to that? Amen. Now, how many of you enjoy the Word of God? Raise your hands. You do? Good, because you're going to hear a lot of it tonight. I can invite you to please stand. I'm reading to you selected verses from the second book of Chronicles, chapter 20, verses 1 onwards. The Moabites and Ammonites, which some of the Meonites came to wage, wage war against Jehoshaphat, alarmed. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt, so they turned away from them and did not destroy them. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord, just as you are standing before the Lord now. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours but God's tomorrow march down against them they will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight the battle. 
Take up your position, stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. I'm going to read this last passage to you again. And there are seven things the Lord says to you here tonight. Things that if you implement in your lives, I promise you every bondage in your life will be smashed to little, little pieces. And you will live the free lives that God wants you to live. Seven steps. Listen carefully. Do not be afraid. And do not be discouraged. This battle is not yours, but God's. The battle belongs to the Lord. Tomorrow march down against them. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. All you need to do is go. I ask you to go and take up your position. Five. Stand firm. Six. See the deliverance the Lord will give you. And seven. The Lord will be with you. We're going to look at each of these in turn. And even as you hear the word of God, you will find deliverance come upon you almost like a miracle. Let me change that. Like a miracle. One, do not be afraid. How many times does the law tell us to do that? In the Bible, he says so 300 times. And 65 times. One for each day of the year. And whenever God speaks to his people, no matter who it is, from Moses to Mary, he always begins with the words, do not be afraid. Because he knows how frightened we sometimes get. He knows we live our lives in fear of what is going to come upon us. He knows that we are scared. So he says to you, fast, do not be afraid. Then he says to, do not be discouraged. Aside from fear, this is the second command he gives us the most because he knows that we get discouraged. How many times do we pray to God and find our prayers are not answered? Sometimes we struggle for years saying, God, won't you listen to my prayer? God, won't you heed my cry? And years pass and nothing seems to happen. Just this morning, I had a young man call me and say, I have been crying out to God for deliverance so many years. I've gone to holy men of God. I've gone to holy women of God. And I've asked them to pray for me. But nothing seems to happen. This man is here tonight. I'm saying to him as I'm saying to you. Do not be discouraged. Because there is not a single prayer you make. That is not answered by God. Sometimes it takes time. One of the reasons it takes time sometimes. Is because there is interference. There was a man called Daniel, a very holy man of God. And one day he wanted to hear the voice of God. So he started praying to God. Days passed, weeks passed, three weeks before finally the angel of God made an appearance and said to Daniel, Daniel, your prayers were heard the very first day you made them. But I'm going to read this to you because it is good. I'm reading from the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 12. 
He continued. This is the angel. And the first words he says to Daniel are what? Do not be afraid. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. God has heard Daniel's cry. As he's heard your prayer. And he sent his angels down to answer that prayer. But sometimes, sometimes the angel struggles along the way. And what happens? We give up. And when we give up praying, the angel returns back to God. And your prayer remains unanswered. So what do you need to do? Keep praying. Keep trusting that the more you pray, Daniel didn't stop praying 21 days on his knees, eating nothing, drinking nothing, just appealing to God, please come down, come down and set me free. Come down and help me. Come down and speak to me. And finally the angel broke through and came down. Persia is mentioned here for a reason. Do you know what Persia is called today? I'm not going to say anything more about it, but think about it when you go home. There's another story that I can tell you about that will tell you how sometimes there is a delay in our prayer. One day, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and on the way he saw a fig tree filled with leaves and he was hungry. So he went to this fig tree expecting to find some fruit and there was none. So angry, he cursed the fig tree. I don't have a lesson, don't have time to give you a full lesson on why he cursed the fig tree. But anyway, he cursed the fig tree. Then he went to the temple. And when he went to the temple, he found people selling things over there. Money changers. People using the temple for all sorts of things, all sorts of purposes. And once again, he got angry and he chased everyone out of the temple. And he said, do you not know? This is my father's ground. You have no business over here. The next morning, he and his apostles were walking by the tree again, and the tree was dead. What happened from the time Jesus said to the tree, die, to the time the tree actually died, what happened? Jesus cleaned the temple. Last week, I asked you to do something. I said, do you not know that your bodies are temples to the Holy Spirit? Clean them. Whatever is inside that is not of God, whatever you do to debase your body, whatever you do to corrupt it, stop those habits and come over here clean. Come over here pure. And when your temple is cleaned, you take away whatever blocks are there, allowing God's words to flow through you and make his will happen in your lives. Clean the temple that is your body. I walk in great power these days. You will not believe the power I walk in now. Because this temple is clean. And I make sure it is clean every day. And I am telling you. I am telling you the grace of God that flows through me now. Is like it never has flowed before. And he will do the same thing in you and your lives. If you understand that your body is a temple to the Holy Spirit. Say after me, my body is a temple to God, the most powerful being in creation. I promise to keep this temple pure and holy from now on. I will not do anything to harm it I will not do anything to debase it. On the other hand, I will do everything I can to make sure that it is pure and sacred and holy so that the Spirit of God can take residence within me to allow me to live a life 
filled with power, filled with might, filled with love. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Do you mean what you said? You got to be careful about coming from my meetings now on, all right, guys? You're going to leave your promising God a lot of things and you better keep up what you promised. Three, the battle belongs to the Lord. I spoke about this also last week. And I said how easy things have become for me. And the reason things have become easy for me is because I don't really take much effort to do anything anymore. Why should I when God is there willing to fight my battles? Think about it because this will liberate you. Many of you think you need to do this and you need to do that and you need to do that. You don't need to do anything. All you need to do is make sure you walk in the path of God and then trust that God will do the rest. All you need to do is listen to what God asks you to do and do it. And then see what God does after you're obedient to him. That is all you really need to do. All you really need to do. Sometimes I think we waste our lives trying to do what God is going to do for us anyway. Instead, just relax. And see what God will do in your lives. There was a great man in the Old Testament, a man called David. He was great even as a boy. And he used to fight lions and bears, barehanded, barehanded. And one day, his land was challenged by the Philistines in the form of a giant. There was this huge guy who came and he stood before the Israelites and he said to them, I am this hot shot, big dude. I challenge you, send anyone, send your bravest warriors to fight against me. And if they can triumph, I will return with my army. Nobody dead. Nobody dead. They see this huge towering creature and nobody dead. Until this young boy, he was a shepherd boy. He went to the king and said, let me do it. Let me face this giant. And the king laughed at him and said, you little boy, what are you going to do? And the king and David said to the king, I have faced our bears and lions I don't fight with my power. I fight with the name of the Lord. And just like I've slain bears and lions, I will go and slay this giant of yours. I'm sure Saul was very amused, but then he must have said, wow, what courage in a man so young. So he said, okay, take my armor, take my shield, take my sword. David put it on. He almost sank with the weight. He said, I don't need all this. I don't need it. And he took it all off. And he picked up five smooth stones and he took his slingshot. And he went to the face of the giant. And the giant was outraged. He says, you dad, come against me. What do you think? I'm a dog. You come with your stick. And David said to him, I don't need swords or spears or any weapons because the battle belongs to the Lord. And he fit one stone in his slingshot and he let go the stone it landed straight on the giant's head and he fell down dead. I know you look small. I know you look feeble. I know when giants stand up against you, there is nothing you can do against them. I know that. But there is nothing you can do against them if you fight with your own power. You fight with your own strength. But if you fight in the name of the Lord, he will grant you victory time and time and time again because the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Go on. The fourth thing he asks us to do is to go and take up our positions. In a verse that all of you surely know by now because it is one of my favorite verses that I've quoted about a hundred times. 
Jesus says to us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. He tells us to go just like he told Jehoshaphat and his army to go and take up your position, but we don't do that. Number one command to all of us and we don't do that. And that's another reason why we constantly and continuously fail because there's no one doing what God is asking them to do. I've said this time and time again. This is not only my job. It's not only my job to go and do the will of God. It is a job of every single one of you sitting here. Seriously. Because if you don't believe this is your job, then you're wasting your time and you're wasting mine. But most important, you're wasting God's. We come here and we receive and we receive and we receive week after week after week. And we do nothing about it. What purpose? What point? Seriously. If I was you, I'd stop coming. What is the point of doing anything? But on the other hand, if you go forth, if you go forth believing that God is there with you, I'm telling you, he will change your life around and he will change the lives of those around you around. Every single person. I know sometimes it is hard to believe. Sometimes there's a reluctance to do what God wants us to do. I was very reluctant. I recently returned from England after one of my most amazing missions over there, but this mission almost never happened. Let me tell you why. I've told you half the story before. I need to tell you the second half. This is my fourth mission to England. On my first mission about six years ago, I landed in this country and a group of nuns welcomed me saying, welcome to our pagan nation. And I thought they were joking until a few days realized, days later I realized it actually was true. England seemed to have lost their faith completely. The churches were empty. Many of them were being sold as gurudwaras, as discotheques, as other places of iniquity. Nobody attended church services. Nobody attended prayer meetings. And I was speaking to empty chairs. The second time was a little better, perhaps because people had heard about me a little more. I had about 100 people, 120 people, but not one of them, not one of them was English. And the third time I received an invitation to come to England was last year. And I said, God, I don't want to go. This place is dead. Nobody believes in you. Nobody cares about you. I'm not going. It's a waste of time. And he said to me, I will never forget. He said, Anil, I died for these people. All I need is someone to go over there and resurrect them again. Go as I command you. And I'm there still with my excuses. I said, I don't even have a program. And I didn't. Because somebody invited me and they said, all we can give you is a workshop for one hour. And I said, I'm going to spend 3,000 dirhams to go all the way to England to deliver a talk for one hour? You must be kidding. He says, I am sending you. Go. So I went over there and I landed in this place. And before I give my first talk, the organizer of the retreat comes to me and says, on the last day of the program, we invite everyone who gathers for this conference in one tent. We normally end it with a concert. This year, we're canceling the concert. We're giving you the talk. You're going to talk to every single person who's here. <clears throat> the second day, I do this workshop. They actually made me speak to the youth, but half the people in that place showed up. Why they showed up, I don't know, because none of them have heard of me before. And immediately after the talk, I met another priest. He says, we have a retreat for priests and bishops every year. Next year, I would like you to come and give that retreat. Would you come? He doesn't know me. He's not really heard me preach. But something in him, something in him is moved to say, invite this man. Imagine this now. It's only God who could make things like this happen. Yes, put your hands together. Don't just think about it. While I was preparing to go there this year, I got another invitation from one priest. He just wrote me one line. We have a meeting on the second Saturday of every month. We'd like you to please come and give us a talk. And I thought, here must be a group of eight people or nine people. And very reluctantly, I tried to back out of it. But for some reason, things were getting canceled to make me accommodate this. And I said, okay, I will be there. I went there. And forget about eight or nine people. There were 2,500 people in that place. Yeah. 
There were healings like you will not believe. 200, 250. There was deliverance like you will not believe. Amazing miracles. And what's the point of this story? The point of this story is that we sometimes think, what am I going to do? Indeed, what am I going to do? But if we trust in him, he works the impossible. And I'm telling you, England is re-emerging, resurfacing, and I can see the faith being sown in every single corner. And it won't be too long now in that country where people no longer go to church, that people will flood the churches and the faith of God will rise again more triumphant than ever before. But not only that, not only that, every corner of this globe, if we believe that God is sending us out in our weakness, in our insignificance, in our nothingness, that he will do the rest because he's still a God of miracles today. Amen. Amen. Then we come to the next point, which is something we've already covered. Stand firm. Oh, we get giants in our lives. We get a few medical issues. We have a few financial problems. We have a relationship that doesn't seem to be going nowhere. And we look at that giant and go, Whoa, man, you're pretty awesome. Don't we? Don't we? Be honest. Almost everyone sitting here is faced with a giant, a Goliath, in their life. And this Goliath snarls and barks and howls and threatens. He walks around us dancing and sneering. What you gonna do, child? I got you. You get frightened. Sometimes he growls. Are you ready for my growl? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Are you pregnant? No. I did this growl in England, and the person almost had a heart attack. <laughs> so I said, no more. <laughs> no more growling. But that's what he does, and he intimidates us. And as we've learned, and I have to repeat this again, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Put on the full armor of God. And stand. And after you've done everything, remain standing. Stand. I have fun with him these days. In the old days, he used to toy with me. Nowadays, I just look at him and say, come on, give me your best. Have you seen these boxing movies? Yeah? This fellow's getting clobbered, but never mind. He gets up and he stands with his hands by his side. Go on, hit me more. Give me the best you have. And that's the way we got to be. Because I'm telling you, our enemy is a fangless creature. He has no power. No power at all. At all. At all. If you're afraid of him, I feel sorry for you. But don't. Don't be. Don't be. He has no power. I stand here like this. Just like this. And I say, come on, let me have it. He can't do anything. He might touch my family, yes. But for every single blow he lands on my wife, my son, my daughter, I tell him I will go and get 1,000 more people for God. Amen. He'd be like that too. He'd be like that too. He troubles your children, doesn't he? He troubles your spouses, doesn't he? He troubles your parents, doesn't he? Tell them you lay one finger on their head. And I'm going to make sure I have an army ranged on my side against you. And that is what I'm doing. 
Are you ready to go to war? Do so, because if you do, you will find the next thing happen. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. These Israelites were once caught with the Red Sea on one side and the Egyptian army on the other side. And they start to worry. They started panic. They started to get afraid. And they went to Moses and said, what's wrong with you? Why did you bring us out here in the desert to die? And Moses said to them, how did he begin? Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will give you today. The enemy that troubles you, you will never see again. All you need to do is stand still. And what happened when they stood still? The waters of a huge sea parted and they made their way to freedom. Imagine on the other hand, imagine on the other hand, they didn't stand still, but like us, they started to do this and started to do that and started to do this and do that. What were they going to do? Swim in the sea? How long would they have swum before they drowned? They fought with the Egyptians? How long would they have survived? Weak and defenseless. But thank God they listened and they stood still. And this is what I'm asking you today. The battle belongs to the Lord. All you need to do, all you need to do is stand still and you will see the deliverance the Lord will give you today because he's the God of miracles even now. And finally, we come to words of manna. The Lord is with you. How many times have I said these words to you? He says it to every person he meets. He begins with the words, do not be afraid. And then he says to them, I am with you. He came to Bethany once and he wept. He wept because His friends who knew him did not believe that he could resurrect their brother and he wept. That is not the only time I imagine he wept. I imagine he wept every time he saw the disbelief in people. I imagine he weeps today when he sees the disbelief in us. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. And there's a story that touched my heart a lot. It is a story of these two men who were on their way back to Emmaus. And they were very dejected. They were very depressed. They were very sad. Their hearts were heavy, their brows were furrowed, their shoulders were slumped as they prepared to make their way back home. And then suddenly Jesus appears to them and says, Yo guy, what's happening? Why are you so low? And these guys said to Jesus, Don't you know what happened? For the last three years, we had this wonderful person called Jesus walking in our midst. What a wise teacher! He performed miracles the world has never seen before. He made the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. He brought the dead back to life. Three days ago, he told us that he was going to be killed. And he told us on the third day, he's going to rise again. Three days ago, that is what happened to him. The chief priests and the rulers, they crucified him on the cross. And today, our women went to the tomb and they find the tomb empty. You know what I feel like doing? I feel like taking their heads and smashing it against each other and saying, you stupid fools. Jesus has told you. He's been with you. He's told you. He's going to die and on the third day, he's going to rise again from the dead. This is the third day. The tomb is empty. Two and two together makes what? Four. And you don't understand. 
Well, it's not only them I get angry with. I get angry with us. And honestly, sometimes I feel like taking your heads and banging you together too. Not, not you? She's saying not me. Okay. What do we need to believe? What do we need him to do more than he already has done? He says, the battle belongs to me. He says, I will heal. He says, I will free. He says, I will bless. He says, I will anoint. What more do we need? We still don't believe. We're slouched. Okay, we're fine now. Get out of here tomorrow morning. You go back to your work and your shoulders will be like that. You start getting a pain in your back and you go, ah, oh, there we go again. You know? Or pain wherever else. A pain in the neck maybe. Your child back answers you and you go, there you go. See, useless fellow. He didn't ever learn. Your husband acts like an idiot. And Lord, when are you going to change this man? When are you going to change? When are you going to change? And when are you going to stand firm and walk in the truth of the resurrection that Jesus Christ is alive and is here in our midst, that he rules. He rules the world, he rules the kingdoms, he rules the nations. He rules us. But in order for us to rule us, we need to stop ruling ourselves. So let's lay ourselves down here tonight and let us give the battle to him because the battle belongs to the Lord. Yes? You're really going to lay yourself down today? You're all going to go out into the world, make disciples of all nations? Good. I need to conclude with how the story ends. Jehoshaphat gets his army together the next day and goes to where God told him to be. And as they go, all the army does is praise God. All they do is sing to his name. And after that, as they take their position and the armies are coming against them, God sows confusion in their midst and they kill each other. They don't have to fire a single arrow. They don't have to raise a single weapon. The battle belongs to the Lord. And then there is the loot to be collected. All the things the devil has stolen from you. All the money he's taken away. All the relations he's damaged. All the other things he's caused problems in your lives. You go there and you take it all back. Why? Because you are the victors. Do you want to take that now? Yes. Good. Can I have my choir please? Father God, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for my brothers and sisters. I want to thank you for your word. What a powerful word. For too long do we struggle, Lord, even though we hear the same things, maybe several times. We don't pay heed, but for some reason, I believe that today you have sown your word deep into the hearts of your children. And I also believe, Lord, that from this moment onwards, they will all start to lead lives of triumph. They will walk in this world like conquerors, not like defeated people. They will walk in this world in boldness and courage with their shoulders squared, with their brows unfurrowed, with strength and with boldness. And they will go and declare to every person in the world that you are king of kings and you are lord of lords. But before we go and do that, Lord, we first need to acknowledge ourselves that you are king of kings. And that is what we're going to do now, Lord, as we sing. He is lord. He is lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is lord. And then we're going to say he is my lord. Let us all stand.
risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead. And he is king. And he is king. Every name. Every shall bow. Shall and every tongue. Every tongue. Confess. That Jesus Christ is king. Let's make it personal. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. He has risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead. And he's my Lord. And he's my Lord. Yes, my knee shall bow. And my tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's my king. Let's all proclaim it. He's my king. He's my king. risen from the dead and he's my king he has risen from the dead and he's my king yes my knee shall bow yes my knee shall bow and my tongue confess and my tongue confess that Jesus Christ 